Before we begin, three messages. What mobile platform do companies like eBay, NBC Universal, the Los Angeles Times, Razorfish, and PayPal use to build their cross-platform native applications? Titanium by Accelerator. They aren't alone. There are now over 25,000 apps deployed by Accelerator, which has been called the Rosetta Stone of app development. And you can start now for free. Just go to www.accelerator.com for more information. So, you've taken some of the advice that has come from untether.tv guests, built an app, and now you're turning your attention to generating some hard-earned revenue. Then you should be looking at Pontiflex app leads. Some of your peers who are using app leads are earning CPMs 100 times the industry average. And if you need any other reasons to start, I'll give you two more. You can run sign-up ads from top brands, the ones that you recognize, and it won't take your precious users out of your app. Go to appleads.com, that's A-P-P-L-E-A-D-S.com to sign up. When my company needed to develop a key mobile product, one that I was counting on as a new source of revenue, I knew exactly who to turn to. Macadamian. They delivered on time with incredible attention to detail and I was able to get product into customers' hands faster than I ever thought possible. I've personally known them for 10 years and they do make great products even better. Check them out at www.macadamian.com. Hello everybody, welcome to Untether.tv. This is that place you've come to rely on for these insightful and in-depth uh, episodes with mobile rock stars. We sit down and extract as much as we can out of them so that you can actually use this, use their tools for your business, or actually uh, you know, get inspiration to go and start your own business in the mobile space. You know, and if you have, let us know. Interesting story here. Uh, my guest today uh, is actually a referral from somebody who, an investor actually, who invested in one of the companies that we actually did a, uh, I did an, an episode with before, and he said that he gave him a little bit of more insight into the type of person that he was investing in. Uh, so it, it shows you that these uh, these episodes are actually generating interest, and uh, if you have a company that is uh, might be looking for investment or looking to reach some people, hey, all of a sudden on Tether.tv is not a bad, bad place to be. So today's company, you know, I've always looked at a way to, that mobile is going to uh, take over the the real world as well as the digital world, and and there's always a gap. You know, it might only be you know a foot or three feet to your TV, for example, but there's a deep, deep, deep hole. And the question here is, how do you how do you bridge the digital with the real? So how do you take your phone and use it right now? How do you take your smartphone and use it in the real world and use it for real world uh, brand building for that company, product sales for that company? Uh, and keep people compelled to be using this product. And that's really interesting. Uh, and that's that's where I'm interested in. And we're going to talk about that today. The company's name is The Tap Lab. The, the, the product is Tap City. And I'm speaking with one of the co-founders, uh, Dave Buscellia. Um, and uh, and we're talking, he's, the company is uh, is uh, was launched in 2009. Product came out early this year. And uh, they're in Cambridge. I mean, I think that's pretty much, that, that's my introduction. Dave, welcome to Untether.tv. Appreciate you being here. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. I appreciate it. I told you, I told I told Dave before that, uh, that A, um, introductions are always a work for me and they're always terrible, um, which means that there's a lot of pressure for the interview to be great, <laughs> right? And the second thing I've been practicing is name for now for 10 minutes and I still got it wrong. Bichelia. Yeah. Yeah. So it just rolls off my tongue now. There's no pressure. Dave, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Um, was I accurate in, in the description of what you guys are doing? Yeah. I mean, we are a location-based gaming company. And uh, our focus right now is iOS. Um, first title's out there. Uh, it's called Tap City. And uh, it's, it's kind of our first play in the space. Um, but we're setting out to build a portfolio of games uh, that leverage location in a similar way. And so I'm going to assume that the Tap Lab is about that. Is is uh, is it only games that you're going to come out with? Yeah. So our focus is creating great games that sit on top of a location graph and leverage all the data where you know the world is your game board and uh, the pieces of each game are kind of just the people and places around you. It's so it's fascinating so because what we're talking about here is. Uh, 
yeah, uh, there's a promise of this industry uh, about uh, you know the world is a game. So you know there's uh, people who have used this for uh, you know a location-based uh, trivia. There's location-based you know check-in where like a company like Scavenger where you check in and you do a game there. But this is this is that game layer on top of all of these locations. But it integrates with real life places right so you can walk us okay first of all just walk us through tap city okay yeah so tap city it's a a massively multiplayer city building game uh so you know we borrowed kind of these proven mechanics from monopoly um risk and and even sim city so the idea is rather than rolling the dice to get to the next spot you walk down the street um and uh you can claim ownership of places build them up um, you know, defend them with everything from force fields to attack dogs. <laughs> you can go out on the offensive and team up with your buddies and launch attacks at other people's properties in your area. Um, so, uh, yeah, think of it as, you know, Monopoly meets Foursquare with a little bit of risk sprinkled on top. I love the risk element. I love that. I roll <laughs> my tanks in there and destroy that force field. <laughs> um so, I mean, where was the inspiration for this? You guys, obviously, you said you've been toiling with this. You've been playing around since uh, late 2009. You launched this uh, in 2011, uh, right? Uh, just recently, in, in the winter of 2011. Um, and, uh, I mean, what? why do this? Like, what, was the, what was the fascination with this? Well, actually, my uh, co-founder, Ralph Shaw, and I, uh, we went to Boston University together as undergrads. And uh, we had this pact that we were going to start a gaming company out of college. <laughs> And uh, I was absolutely fascinated with location-based services. And uh, it, it seemed like everything out there was under this umbrella of location-based gaming, you know, yep. Foursquare, Goala, and Eat Scavenger. Um, but none of those services are really games at their core. They're you know, gamified social utilities and local deal finders. So we saw that gap in the market, and we just said, hey, well, let, let's fill it. Let, let's create one of the first pure games that leverages location as a competitive landscape. Uh, so we actually we launched uh, the alpha of Duality, which was our, our first title at Boston University with 100 students. And Kenmore Square uh, turned into a war zone. You know, <laughs> we added in the dorm buildings and the classroom buildings, and the students just went nuts for it. Um, so that kind of sent shivers down our spine, and we said, all right, we're on to something here. Uh, let's, uh, let's get to work. So uh, uh, obviously, uh, this is a this is this resonates. Um, I mean, when you did it for for the school, um, did it did it grow? I mean, what happened to that? Did it uh, kind yeah. of? Is it like that? That you know, what is it? The the curve of hope and then the trough of despair. Is that what happened, kind of thing? <laughs> well, we actually so we ran this uh, alpha for about a month and a half, and you know, we had a hundred students sign up. Um, you know, pretty good conversion rates in terms of active players because. Yeah. Back then, you had to do like this long process with a unique identifier, and you know it yeah, took it was a tough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the the magic of you know location based games is that we could actually see it expanding on the map. So we we could see the first few players sign up, and then all these other players are popping up around them. And to be honest, that first title we we hadn't balanced it. It was really our, our test kitchen. Okay. And. Um, we just saw like this explosion where kids were driving around in their cars and taking over like a hundred properties in a night, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I mean it, it, it spread like wildfire among that group of uh, students. But again, it was capped off at a hundred because of our uh, kind of the limitations of the iOS platform. Right. Back. right. So I mean, obviously a, a good testing ground, and um, I mean when you hit your peak. Um, what were the expectations? You just wanted to see what this was like, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, for us, it was you know um, all about really testing out that core concept of ownership of real world properties, and you know we kind of had this um, this idea that you know building games that tap into people's kind of emotional connections to the places they already know and love, right. um, you know there there was something there that there was some kind of untapped level of engagement. Um, and uh, that's what we found. I mean, people, they have this sense of ownership already for these properties and uh, willing to do anything to defend it. That's hysterical. So this is one of those things where, you know, you, you basically you play on the emotions. Um, and, uh, I mean, I can see, uh, like, you know, dorm battles ensuing, right? <laughs> uh, and then, so walk us through this process, right? So you, um, you're a Techstars graduating company. You just graduated in June of this year. Um 
I mean, what uh, what was so compelling, for example, in your mind that that this is a neat idea, right? This is this is kind of the gamification of the planet, um, mm. and I love the idea of watching this thing spread. It's like, uh oh, you know, now we're everywhere. Yeah. Um, so the, obviously, this is a and location services are another layer that that uh, people are investing in like crazy right now. Uh, so you you combine kind of as you said. The location level, the gaming level, probably the group chat level, and it's like you're doing everything where everybody's putting hundred million dollars into these companies individually. You guys are kind of yeah. building it out, and then you've got to build that sticky layer. So, I mean, what what do you think it was about uh, about your company that got you into TechStars? Because you know it's not easy. Not everybody gets in. <laughs> yeah, well, we were actually um, so we're based right here in Cambridge, and we were right across the street at a co-working center um, from where TechStars is here. Okay. And uh, surrounded by uh, former tech stars companies, and we, we really looked up to these guys. And um, yeah, I mean, I think it was the fact that you know, uh, it was such a local craze going on here in, in Kendall Square um, that you know we were able to build that momentum leading up to the whole application process. And also, you know, we're a small team; we're three guys. Um, we were able to accomplish a lot with very little. Yeah. And I think you know that was really the spark that got us in uh, to TechStars was um, just what we were able to achieve and the traction we had, um, you know, so far, which was just really a bootstrapped company. And that uh, that says a lot, right? Uh, obviously, the uh, you hit a nerve, you, you can create a little bit of demand for the product, and uh, and then you uh, good good on you to ride that. I mean, what was the what was the the benefit of being a part of TechStars? Have you guys found that yet, or is it is it uh, is it all that it's meant to be? Yeah, I mean, so with TechStars, you know, you get some some capital um, yeah. right out of the gates, free office space, no complaints there, and um, you know, surrounded by other companies that are doing really cool things, and a, a lot of synergies there that were incredibly valuable throughout okay. the program. But also, you're surrounded with this, um, you know, network of advisors and mentors, uh, which we tapped into on a on a weekly basis. Um, and not, not to mention, you, the program really sets you up to um, close that initial round of funding, um, and we're making uh, great progress on that. Well, we're going to come back to the funding. It's is it, uh, <laughs> but is that the goal? I mean, when you go when you go into TechStars, was it? Uh, I mean, what was your reasoning to go in? Was it uh, the mentorship? Was it the fact that you're going to get some money, free space, mm -hmm. all of those things, or was it the fact that listen, this is going to set us up? We know that we're going to need some investment to to grow this thing. Um, I mean, what was the what was the reason why you guys went in? So you know, we decided to come in due to the community and and the network. I mean, really, you know, this is, we're first time entrepreneurs, yeah. and um, we saw huge value in surrounding ourselves with people who have been there, people who have done that, um, and and as a result, we have a stellar team of advisors um, and and investors that that really you know understand our space. I see that's. It's like, um, you know, I often talk about this is that people who, who don't go to university uh, or don't go into high, you know, higher education, it's often not about the degree that you come out with, unless you're a doctor, which I please, please, please go to school. Yeah. <laughs> there are certain things you don't have to go to school for, you know, and, and um, so being an entrepreneur is something that you, you inherently have or you're influenced by, and, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not sure that you can really teach it. You have it, and then you exploit it, but... Uh, but one of the things that you miss when you go to you don't go to university is that uh, that circle of influence, right? Yeah. So being put into the middle of something like TechStars, that's exactly what that happens. Is that those companies, your graduating class, are your brethren, right? They're yeah. your graduating class, and then you ha you've been exposed. So it's got to yeah. have just tremendous <laughs> long term value. Yeah, I mean the other thing is you know we were working out of our our uh, apartment for a right. while there. And uh, we felt like complete nuts because we'd be working from 8 a.m. till 3 a.m. That's right. No, no other humans. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No other humans operating level. And then you get into tech stars. It's like, hey, we're in the nut house. Everything feels normal, you know? Exactly. <laughs> You're just working those same hours, but somewhere else. Exactly. With yeah. a bunch of other people. So people right next to you. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it is a culture, isn't it? And, and uh, you know. I think that, uh, you know, I talk to a lot of uh, university and college students and, I, and they, I, you know, I, I do the same thing as everybody else does. How many people want to be entrepreneurs? You know, what are your reasons? Well, you know, they're young and they say to get rich, to get rich quick. And I say, well, well go buy a lottery ticket because yeah. go and sit, you know, for a week inside of Techstars and you'll see what it's like to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. It smells, you know, it, you know, you're, you know, 
your health is terrible. You're eating poor, you know, ramen noodles basically. And, yeah. um, but what you're doing is you're, you're, uh, inflicting your passion, right? And that's what it is. You're inflicting your passion on the world and that's what being an entrepreneur is. So, uh, it's not glorious. There, it's not glorious at all. Uh, so on that ringing endorsement, for those of you who are still listening and watching, um, talk about this. Uh, you know, obviously Techstars is a brand, right? And it comes with it, that, that level of, uh, of awareness, especially from the technology community, especially now because of uh, the companies that it's been able to spawn out of it. Uh, how do you leverage that now? Um, so really the valuable thing for us has just been, you know, we've got this network um, both here in Boston in New York, um, out in Boulder, Colorado, from all the different Techstars locations. Um, uh, and I, I've been on this kind of fundraising road trip uh, for the past few months here, and just such warm introductions coming from this network. Um, and, and friendly advisors across the board, um, you know, and it, the, that's where the real value is, okay. just off-the-cuff responses to any questions we have. These really important you know, critical, strategic, and uh, you know, uh, operation decisions we're making right now. Uh, having that advice from people who've been there and done it along the way has been huge. It's pretty. It's pretty, it's pretty incredible. incredible. Um, so you said that you're. We're going to come to the product. I, I swear. We're, <laughs> we're going to get back into into what the Tap Lab is about. But um, you said that you're looking, obviously, to raise to raise funding. Yeah. Um, and and being a part of this, uh, being a part of TechStars is one of these things. As you said, it opens up the Rolodex, so to mm -hmm. speak, right? It's it's a it's certainly a the equivalent of uh, of a door opener, a yeah. big door opener. Um, so that process, um, did were you looking for funding before TechStars, uh, or is it just since you've since you've come out of TechStars? So yeah, we were bootstrapping straight into TechStars. Okay. Um, and we kind of looked at TechStars at a ca as a catalyst towards our okay. uh, seed round. Okay, uh, it just—it would be interesting to see. You know, you're struggling to find money before. I was looking for the real human interest story here, right? <laughs> uh, like we couldn't get anywhere, we couldn't get any money, we couldn't do anything, and then we we went into tech stars, and now it's like, you know, cash is raining down on us. Uh, yeah, we just heard that there were free burritos on Fridays. That, that's really it. <laughs> that's it. It's like <laughs> we haven't eaten all week. <laughs> we just we just need food. Well, so uh, obviously now now you are raising. Um, you said that you're close to closing closing your round uh, and yeah. there's still some spots open um, but is it uh, and, and the seed round for a company like this uh, have you disclosed how much you're looking for or is that yeah. off, the, off the record we're uh, raising 500,000 okay so this is true seed like this yeah. that, that's an amount of money that I can wrap my head around I know what to do with five, $500,000 you know I look around at some of the series A that's been going on you know 20, 50 million I'm like what in God's name I'd hire Springsteen right every day <laughs> he'd be playing next to me while I code um <laughs> That's Bruce Springsteen for you young guys yeah. out there. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you, you go through all this process. Uh, did your product change during that during this whole time during Techstars? Did you kind of get in there and say, this is yeah. what we're going to do? And then you came, you came out and said, this is what we're doing? Yeah. No, we, we didn't make the, the big pivot, per se. Oh, good. Uh, it's so unique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when it came down to it, I mean, I, I guess the, the biggest kind of step that we took was towards more social and group gameplay. And that actually came from the majority of the other Techstars participants <laughs> playing Tap City in and around the office. That's cool. And us hearing all this smack talk going around. <laughs> um, and as a result, we were like, hey, guys, I mean, would you like to team up when you're launching an attack? Like, would you shake your phone to join an attack? And, you know, all these, these ideas were coming from that community. Um, and again, that's one of the really magical parts of publication based gaming is it's right around you all the time. Well, so that's a really that's a really cool uh, approach, right? Is that a lot of people talk um, about testing this in, in the in the wild, right? So you've done these two tests. You did it in with your school and then, you know, obviously it was compelling enough for people uh, it, with other companies uh, working these crazy yeah. hours with other ideas uh, to to play and get engaged with. But you then have this petri dish around you, which is you're yeah. watching all this stuff on uh, you know, and taking notes basically. Is that true? Like, is that what yeah. it was like? Yeah, I mean, for us, you know, we, we built in this uh, feedback loop as well. So, you know, we were hearing from players um, about their experience here, there, and everywhere. Um, the, the cool part is um, with uh, Tap City, you can play it anywhere on planet Earth. And we have players in Australia, we have players in Ireland uh, that are, are giving us feedback on their experiences. Um, and, you know, 
nothing is more exciting than you know uh, hearing that one of our players took over Disney World and is under attack and uh, <laughs> you know, wants us to send him support. You know, <laughs> send in the air raid. Right? <laughs> what? Um, so, <laughs> I mean, I can I can just imagine this is that. Um, uh, you know, this this must open a world of opportunity for revenue. And, you know, and it, it's, it's my obligation to ask you this. Um, and I'm very interested because, um, and I'm pretty sure we could spend an hour or two just talking about the revenue opportunities for this. But you, you must have had an idea going into this. Listen, you know what? Um, we know that it's a short distance to a revenue because of this. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I got first of all, I mean, what would it take for you guys to get to a point where you think you could start generating revenue users wise? Do you have an idea around that? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. We're already, you know, a revenue stage company per se. Um, we've got uh, a virtual goods marketplace, um, and, and again, it's all through iTunes. So yeah. players are upgrading their avatars. They're bu buying blueprints for the properties they own in the game. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, as kind of the core economic engine, that virtual goods model is already in place. Yeah. Uh, we've got some really big plans for where we can take that. Uh, but there's another huge opportunity for you know, incorporating local offers and deals into the platform and into the experience, as well as you know branded content that is actually a part of the gaming experience, right, not, right. not just a banner ad at the bottom of a list. Well, so. well, I'm going to come back to the uh, to the monetization piece around uh, couponing and, and local yeah. goods or or, um, or location based goods because I'm really interested by this virtual marketplace uh, yeah. because I think that uh, you know maybe beyond all this is an opportunity to to continuously expand right mm -hmm. um, um, but do you, do you, do you think that companies like Disney you know, um, when there's a battle going on for Disney World, or you know, there's a Gap store that's that's owned by me or somebody else. Um, what do you think their reaction is going to be if this thing takes off? Are they are you going to get a call one day from the Gap or Disney saying, um, "Look, that's that's our store. We we own the rights not only terrestrial but we owned it digitally as well. Yeah. Uh, we want to evict this guy. Give it back <laughs> to us." Uh, do you see a day like that happening where it's like, look, I got the digital deed here and yeah. get off our land? <laughs> I, uh, I mean, it, it's kind of like um, public domain per se yeah. in terms of uh, you know these addresses and, and the listings. Yeah. Um, but we do think it, there's some actually uh, there's some very interesting um, advertising opportunities there, um, such as you know uh, brand A placing a uh, you know attack dog out front of brand B uh, <laughs> and paying for that to be there to scare off users you know <laughs> I, you can you can definitely see this this could get like pretty petty and spiteful inside yeah. couldn't it like uh, spy versus spy right uh, kind of kind of deal uh, which I think would be great um, because I know once you get to that point you've, you've obviously created something that's of great success right when yeah. when when there's brand against brand I didn't yeah. do that what are you talking about <laughs> um, you know what other what other things are you exploring around? Uh, I mean, virtual goods. Like, um, there's got to be some kind of um, uh, you can almost build an economy on top of this, couldn't mm -hmm. you? Yeah. So, I mean, so far we're actually valuing properties in the game. Oh come based, on, really? Based uh, on what? The, the uh, amount of check-in activity within a rolling thirty-day period. Yeah. So the idea is we can pull all of that data from a location graph and have this kind of predefined virtual real estate marketplace where every property is valued based on its popularity. So what would you do? Would you um, you pull in information like from Foursquare, all the stuff that's readily available, all the all the sign-ins or check-ins, and then um, like, would you ever see a day where you where you uh, you can either buy the property digitally or attack it to win it kind of thing, or you have that option? Yeah, so uh, to date, um, you can't just straight up buy a property. Yeah. There's actually game mechanics tied into the whole process. Yeah. Um, you have but, to attack it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, there's a huge opportunity for kind of this back end um, buy, sell, trade economy as yeah. well, um, which could be monetized yeah. uh, directly. See, I, like, I, I love this because as an entrepreneur, all I see are, are opportunities. And when I heard somebody from second, you know, the first time I heard uh, Second Life, somebody from Second Life making a million dollars in, in digital transactions, like this is years ago, right? Yeah. And, uh, and and uh, buying land 
you know, just buying excess land and then selling it or renting it to people. And then there was that, uh, you know, pardon me, but that idiot who's paying somebody virtual, you know, real currency, but virtual currency to rent land from somebody who doesn't exist. Um, I started thinking, okay, well, th this is incredible because it's yeah. basically you're inventing, you're inventing a, an economy. And if you get enough users, enough players and enough continuous use, mm -hmm. I mean, that becomes a reality. People are willing to pay this. And when I sat with uh, with people that I know that said I'll never buy virtual currency, and then he said, well, actually, no, 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 I, you know, I bought some, um, I bought some cool yellow Converse for for my Wiimote. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and then I bought like you know a, an Ottawa Senators jersey for my. my yeah. Well, you did. So, you know, you've basically proven the model. Yeah. So with this thing, it's um, you really have a massive opportunity. So mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur, how do you kind of uh, contain that focus? To the things that you've got to get done today versus yeah. the things that you know you could turn into revenue. Yeah, I mean, in terms of um, kind of uh, the launch pad for us, well, we decided to focus really on uh, on this virtual goods marketplace and, and tying in these assets to the player experience, so, so the player's avatar and the properties they own, the, the, the core game mechanics. Sure. Um, and you know, obviously, we're very excited about bringing in branded content and location-based offers. But the truth is, we want to focus on creating great content. We want to outsource the sourcing of all those deals, offers, all, all those, all that branded content. And there's a bunch of third-party providers out there that have open APIs that we can tap into with our platform. Um, and you know, we're looking into um, you know, Tap Me, yeah. Play Haven. Um, and these guys are doing some really cool stuff that, again, it's not a banner ad at the bottom of a list. It's an uh, interactive brand experience. It's a Red Bull power-up that increases your attack um, you know, force by 5x. You know? yep. Something that a player would actually want to interact with. <laughs> so, so, I mean, this has got to be... How do, how do you prove that? So how do you go to Red Bull and say, listen, hey, here's this crazy thing. Because yeah. right, maybe Red Bull's a bad guy. I mean, it, it seems to have a, a tapped into uh, uh, to a younger demographic. But mm -hmm. but how? And maybe maybe I'm wrong on that. But how do you go to a guy wearing a suit and tie, and saying, "Hey, listen, okay, we got this thing. It's a virtual game on top of real life, and we want we want to do this power up that involves like Gatorade or something like that." How do you sell that, man? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's all about engagement, right? I mean, that's kind of the holy grail here. Yes. And, and that's why we saw such a huge opportunity in making location-based games, not in quotes, but in all caps, bold, games. Yeah. Because, you know, games produce the highest level of engagement. It's, yep. you know, people are coming to Tap City for an intrinsic fun. Yep. Um, and we're seeing that. I mean, our, our daily active users are playing 25 minutes a day on average. Come on. And it's pretty solid. Um, it's up there with some of the top performing games on the App Store in terms of engagement. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're confident we can take that even further. So how do you, how do you um, I mean, do you disclose the numbers of game, gamers that you have? Not yet. Okay. Um, but, you know, we've got a, a nice test kitchen here in the Boston area. And we do have players all around the world. Right. Um, and that's kind of the magic of leveraging Google and Foursquare. So, uh, how, how? Why do you think it is twenty five minutes? Like twenty five minutes is a long time, right? Uh, yeah. It's like my kids playing Angry Birds, right? Well, that's, what? <laughs> that's a long time. So twenty five minutes to play this game, especially a location game that that yeah. involves being outside, yeah. right? Um, how how do you how do you account for that? Well, an interesting thing is obviously it's it's session frequency and session duration yeah. is what we're counting here, and you know. One thing we've tracked in the player progress is, you know, how many properties does a player need to have before they spike up into that active user category? Right. So before they go uh, casual to user, right? Yeah, and the truth is, once you have you know three to five properties in the game, you you've got this footprint in this emergent world, and we've got all these dynamic calls to action that are pulling you back in. So you have to you know tend to your properties, upgrade them, collect your rent, Farmville, <laughs> and keep the sheep fed. Right. <laughs> the cool part, though, someone else in the real world walks by your property and launches an attack. Yeah. You receive a push notification, and you're okay. emotionally drawn back into the game because you've got that sense of ownership. You spent time, effort, and possibly money building up this property, and you don't want to lose it. 
um, the cool part is you can pull in all your friends for uh, support as allies. And, uh, so um, it's got to be, uh, you know, my, my, my follow-up question to that was, you know, how, how do you get people, you know, I was, um, did I play a game for a long time? I'm just trying to think of the games that I would play for a little bit of time. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I'm going to take Foursquare for an example. Is that you know the, the gamification of Foursquare? Um, you know, everybody seemed to play it for a long time. Everybody checked in everywhere you go, and then all of a sudden it was like uh, too much of an effort. I, it kind of wanes after a little bit of time. Yeah. Same thing with something like Instagram, right? Where yeah. it's not a game, but uh, you know, it was so great, and now it's now it's like uh, it's photos, right? So how do you get over that? How do you get people over that? Where it's like they're coming back day after day. Um, and it's got to be a little bit more because at some point it's like, ah, oh, stop. I don't want to defend that anymore. Right. Take it. Yeah. So, so how do you bring people back in? So for us, it's, it's all about that community driven gameplay. Right. And, you know, from the outset, we said we want to take you know, the magic of massively multiplayer games to mobile, but present it in a way that's consumable, uh, you know, uh, right. And approachable to, to you know the, the more casual um, players that we see on mobile. And, so, and how do you, give me an example of something like that? Well, the the idea is every single player is a content creator, yeah. and every player influences this emergent world. Um, so the idea is rather than having a call to action, which is hey, there's a new um, item in the virtual goods store today. It's hey, this guy just checked into your property and left you a a note yeah. or hey this guy just teamed up with five of his buddies and is launching an attack on your favorite property or your friend is launching an attack on this property and needs your support you know it's much more relevant in terms of the calls to action um, and, and it's always going so so then I mean uh, obviously this is um, um, you know when you get a, a great mix of game um, it becomes addictive, and that's one of the things that you hope that happens with this is that people start to use it, and they start to get using it. And, and even if they're just using it once a week or once every every couple of days, they're still engaged with it. Then, how do you turn those guys into who might not buy a virtual good, who might not be engaged in anything other than defending a property or just scouting out new properties, helping you expand your map, so to speak? Yeah. How do you get those guys um, to to open up their wallets, and or how do you how do you bridge that with a brand how do you how do you make the big dollars other than you know um, relying on the number of users you have it's interesting yeah I mean in terms of relying on the number of users it, and the monetization um, in this kind of micro transaction environment in standard uh, social online gaming we're seeing like you know two to three percent conversion right. uh, and then again you'd monetize the, the remaining uh, ninety seven percent with advertising with ads right um, and in the more the more competitive, massively multiplayer environments, um, that that number, that percentage is significantly higher in terms of the amount that monetize, um, and, and that's kind of what we're gunning for is, is to you know um, uh, step fur further than what we've seen in social online gaming. Um, but really, you know, uh, our approach here is to leverage those third-party providers of sponsored content, but re but source content that is a you know fits into the experience. So you know we're not just going to be pushing Groupon yeah. ads onto a map w w with a little dot next to it. it it's going to be something that's really tied into the player experience. Um, and we've got a few uh, cool uh, ways of integrating that into the map, which really is our game board. It's it, it's where you go to play the game. Yeah, and, and I mean, like an example could be what like um, I've um, I've got my favorite neighborhood pub. I'm in there. I've taken it over. I yeah. I own the deed, and then. Uh, they they they're a forward thinking pub, yeah. so they say okay anybody who is who owns the deed is that like a mayorship kind of thing or or anybody who who uh, who who checks in there or something like that you're offering deals you're offering discounts that kind of stuff do you get into that or is, yeah, that, so, is that cheap in the game? Um, I, we we have talked about adding in kind of um, sponsored mini games that are triggered yeah. by check ins. Um, and the idea is that this would be kind of a, a meta game mechanic, and it, it would be opt in. Um, for instance, you know, you you, you uh, check in or you visit a Dunkin' Donuts in the game, uh, and when you walk through the front door, you, you can do this Munchkin toss, and if you get all six in, you get a free coffee. You know, I, I think those kind of experiences, if they are fun and 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 not forced, yeah. but just like hey, you know, yeah. 
you've been to this place five times this week. Uh, here's a cool game for you to check out. That works. But what we're really excited about is allowing brands to get involved in, in the experience. For brands to, you know, build up the properties and, and actually dish out virtual currency based on the activity surrounding their locations. Um, and the idea is there, you know, a brand could certify its location on the map um, and, you know, it would really stand out to the players in the area. So what do you, uh, so it's also compelling, right? Like that, that's, that's the great thing about this is that from an entrepreneur standpoint, you, you know, hey, listen, r- real estate around us is, um, is taken, right? Yeah. But this allows everybody to get into the market pretty quickly, doesn't it? Like, yeah. I mean, this is, this is just like, it, it's really opportunistic to build that, that virtual layer on top of the real world in order to, to, to turn it into revenue. Um, I, but how, like, do you think that how big could this grow? Like, how big do you think you guys could get? Yeah, I mean, our our, uh, our vision for the company is, is to really to be, be the leader in this new genre of games. I mean, we've had talks with other location-based gaming companies about petitioning for Apple to create a new subcategory in the games category on iTunes. Uh, because we really see this as an entirely new genre of games. Um, and, you know, we've got this refrigerator, theoretical refrigerator, full of ideas for follow-on titles. Yeah. The truth is, we're struggling to keep it shut because, you know, there's so much you can do within this environment. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is an enormous opportunity. And what's even more compelling is the fact that all of these enablers, all of these third-party providers of location-based offers and um, sponsored content, are looking at the gaming space. They're looking at location-based gaming as a huge opportunity for them, in terms of um, you know who they can provide these services to. Well, I think that this is something that um, uh, you, what I'd like to get into. I mean, is is the Tap Lab because the concept of the Tap Lab um, to build out all of these games. Like, are you building an engine here, and then you just want to add new? You want to skin that engine uh, for for new opportunities. Yes. So the truth is, you know, over the past uh, few years here, we've identified the core issues or the core challenges with location-based gaming. And, you know, it's everything with player density, you know, um, places density, just ensuring that players always have a dynamic gaming experience yep. every time they open up one of our games. Right. And, and, and that's all on the back end. The, that's what we're raising this money to build out. Um, and yeah, the, the goal is further down the road to have a catalog of titles that are all interconnected and, and all working together. So with, with, with this platform, um, like obviously the R&D, the, the heavy lifting mm. is, a, is that first version of the game, isn't it? Yeah. And, and then, so what do you do, what do you do um, once that's, like, how do, you, how do you build another product that doesn't compete with the existing product? It's interesting. Um, you know, there are, a lot of different approaches out there. I mean, Zynga has their, their model of jumping the shark, right? So they've got one title that goes up, and yeah. once it reaches maturity, they introduce the follow-on title, and, and again, right. they don't lose those existing players, and they're able to pick up more players as a result. So um, they leverage their mailing list, and then they go out and say, listen, you know, Farmville sucks, but they got this other one, Cityville, is coming out, right? Yes. Uh, or Farmville's on a decline, and Cityville then picks that up. Yes, and that model certainly works uh, when you've got, uh, you know, a, a user base of that size. And, you know, one thing that, that we really focused on was, was how can we, um, rather than just saying, hey, well, we're going to do the shotgun approach and launch 30 titles right out of the gates, how can we create really quality titles that have a longer player lifespan and a longer title life cycle? And looking at these massively multiplayer online games, we tried to figure out what really makes that work. And again, it goes back to that community-driven experience. You know, when you're joining a, a faction or a team and you're playing together and you're building up these empires that are existent in that emergent world, um, you know, there's some deeper meaning to it. it, it <laughs> There's got to be. You know, your epic mission um, that, that keeps players around longer. And, and we hope to build out titles that have that longer lifespan, that longer title life cycle. Um, and, and again, for these follow-on titles, yeah, you know, we could just do a reskin of, of what we have in the marketplace today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, make it fluffy and cuddly, or um, you know, like, intense and full contact. 
And, and is that what you is that what you anticipate you're going to do? Is that listen, you know, uh, so we're doing this right now, which is kind of a generalized city yeah. theme, right? Yeah. And then uh, what uh, like. Do you then kind of break it down a little bit? Like you'll go medieval, you'll go battling yeah. dragons, you'll go like <laughs> killing Care Bears, that kind of stuff? <laughs> um, for the most part, you know, our, our plans for following titles are, are to, you know, use the platform, but again, leverage location in a different way. So bring new experiences that players can play side by side. And the idea is we want, uh, we want there to be players of our platform. And the idea is they can access these titles um, through different or access the their experience, their avatar through these different lenses, which are our different titles. Oh, wow. It's, it's like, a very unique position in location-based gaming because you've got this macro world in the back end. Exactly. Do you think that it's going to get too crowded up there, though? Like in this virtual world, like you know, uh, <laughs> you know, everybody's doing it, and then you you know, I, I see a beautiful play for augmented yeah. reality for you, right? It was like you you basically can deck out that building or that geo location, right? yeah. the longitude and latitude. You hold up your iPhone to it, and it's like it doesn't look like anything. It's an empty spot, but you hold up your iPhone, it's like everything that you've ever bought is right there. Yeah. You know, so you've totally decked out. You can see your dogs barking at the front, and you can see yeah. you know the attack going on. Like like, do you start thinking that big? Because man, that would be pretty cool. Yeah, so I mean, uh, obviously, there's a huge opportunity in like next generation uh, 3D mapping of cities yeah. is a huge opportunity for us. Um, and you know, augmented reality, you know, it, there are things that we could do today that would look pretty funky. Yeah, but, you know, within 12 months' time, we can really create something um, you know, cool. top notch. <laughs> it's so cool. <laughs> so I, I gotta, I gotta ask this question. Or he's about, uh, he's really around marketing this thing. So yeah. uh, how do you how do you guys plan on creating awareness? So so a seed run fund is great, but that's probably a technology rollout seed fund um, with a little bit of marketing dollars associated with. Not many people like to put money into marketing, um, put put seed seed money into marketing. But how do you how do you, how do you market this? Is this all viral? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, in the mobile space, um, you do need to allocate some funds towards marketing. There's uh, a lot of noise. Yeah, and you know. Uh, a lot of people have heard of you know AdMob and, and all these platforms, yeah. but really, you know, th there's a science to kind of blending it all together. So you've got the paper acquisition, paper engagement models as well, um, and, and also partnering up with other social game develop, social mobile game developers to kind of do that exchange. Yeah. Um, but the interesting thing for us is we're able to leverage not only the social graph but the location graph as a means of player acquisition. Sure, sure. Um, and, and that's really what we're banking on here in terms of viral growth. So, uh, I mean, uh, as an example, how would you how would you integrate that the location into this? Is that uh, you know you you put a, a sticker on somebody's door or or what happens there? Yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, you know viral growth in an area, there's clearly a lot we can do in terms of um, uh, generating word of mouth. Yeah. And having fantastic events happen in an area that can be tied to uh, you know a good PR push, yeah. uh, but in terms of leveraging location graph, you know the idea is we can be sending these invitations that are tied not only to your friends but the properties your friends are visiting. Right. Um, and right. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I, you know, I, I keep thinking, you know, elections would be great, right? You've got your yeah. campaign headquarters for you know the Democrats or the Republican or you know the Green Party or whatever it is, and and uh, battles ensuing there, n yeah. not only in real life but in in uh, in the digital world as well. You know, the de Democrats have just uh, you know done a <laughs> complete offensive on the Republicans and I, yeah, I, team red team. I think that that would come together pretty easily. Yeah, exactly. It would be like full out you know a battle, and you could see the divisions right when you start to do yeah. this for advanced polling. Even it would be so much fun. You'd see. You know, the maps are you blue or are you red you know uh, where does it fit and uh, and then you could overlay that about uh, over the voting anyways we're way off but but <laughs> you start to you start to see the influence of the virtual world in the real world and our beliefs are the same for the most part um, you know m uh, maybe second life is like this is how I really wanted to live but uh, yeah. but ultimately with something like this you could you could um, you could extract some serious data from this uh, which is which is pretty cool is that part of the business plan as well the data that you're collecting yeah, I mean, so far, um, you know, the, the steps that we've taken have been just to kind of represent existing data in a new way yeah. that adds more value to the game. So, like I said, you know, we're tying those popularity coefficients to each and every property yep. in, in the game world, but we're pulling all that data from Foursquare. Right. Um, 
it, does that it, worry it, you that you're, you're pulling that data from a third party? Like, uh, does that kind of put put you guys at uh, uh, you know at their mercy? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, we've been asked this question many times, and the truth is, we have. I thought I was like, come on, I got <laughs> one question left, and, and I got <laughs> all of these. You've had an answer for everything. I haven't stumped yeah. you yet. <laughs> Damn. I thought I was being smart there, but uh. we've got this switch in the back of our platform, uh, which allows us to just step smoothly from one uh, place's API to the next. Yeah, um, and you know we've actually got uh, Google Places as kind of a backup uh, already set up. But uh, the interesting thing with Foursquare is you know there's a lot of extra value that comes from that. So you know players or users of Foursquare can create. Um, properties in the game. So we, we've got kids oh, battling over tree forts in their backyards <laughs> actually, <laughs> because they were able to add them to the Foursquare API. So that's that's pretty amazing. You know, yeah. I love that. Um, last question here. It's a big one, um, mm -hmm. and we don't have a lot of time. Uh, how do how how can companies? So I'm talking to about these guys who are trying to figure out how to bring mobile into their business right now. So this is one of those things where. You know, um, I always caution about jumping into apps right away. I say, like, you know, that's a huge investment. You, you, you know, make sure that you do it properly. Um, and so I say that there's always a, a cheap way, an efficient way to get into the mobile space, right? There's something that fits your business. So to those guys out there who are trying to figure out how to bring you into their business or bring mm -hmm. them into your virtual world, um, how, how do they do this? Yeah, I mean, so we're actually looking into doing a few pilots right now with local businesses. And, you know, the interesting thing with location-based gaming is, you know, it's the, the um, amount of users on in the game as a whole isn't as important as the amount of players in your area. Um, so, you know, okay. if you've got a few thousand players um, yep. within walking distance of your store, um, you know, there's some real value there. Um and so, like, what do they do? Do they just go and stake their claim on that store? Do, do they pay you to do something? How can they? How can they start to engage with those one thousand people that are within their within the neighborhood? Yeah, so they can actually certify their location or their locations okay. uh, in our game. And, and the idea is, we can actually design a custom store, virtual storefront on the map, and okay. drive players to that storefront through promises for you know uh, uh, increased check-in bonus or, or increased income bonus sponsored by the company okay. that is that location. All right, so so this is really, but that would that that would cost them money or is there something that, that they could do? I mean, do you monetize that piece? Yeah, so, so we will be monetizing that. And the idea is, you know, it's, it's providing something of, of, of true value to the player. Because I mean, people are playing this game um, with this, uh, you know, goal of building out their empire, yeah. and if a brand can help them get there quicker, yeah. um, and 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 have some fun along the way, uh, and and clearly the the um, you know uh, the light at the end of the tunnel here is we can drive real world uh, transactions. We can get people in those stores, uh, redeeming virtual coupons, re redeeming uh, these deals and offers. See, and I think that that's that's a great way, great place to end. Is that ultimately. Through all of this, the engagement has to be there from the user base, which is the gameplay. But for you as a business, you can create a marketplace that relies on you know uh, bringing in new users and replacing existing users and getting people to uh, you know to buy virtual goods. Um, but the flip side of that is to to grow. Uh, you also have to be able to try to be able to bring people into real life businesses, and that's that that bridge. That's mm -hmm. the bridge between the digital side, the mobile side. And, uh, you know, this virtual world that you're creating and the fact that, listen, that restaurant still needs to fill that seat. And if this is yeah. a way to do it, then they're going to use your service until it, it doesn't work anymore. Right? Yeah. Uh, Definitely. And yeah, we see a huge opportunity across the board in terms of this kind of hybrid revenue model of virtual goods tied to the real world, sponsored content tied to the real world, and all of that coming together in that gaming environment. Ah, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing. And... and like if if you guys who are watching or listening out there, um, you just start to run your imagination through some of the scenarios that you can leverage a technology like this. You know that game layer on top of the planet, whatever. If you're at a concert or an event or a hockey game or a baseball game or a football game, you start to think about what what you could be doing inside of uh, of this game at that at that play. And even if you're uh, you're running these teams or you're running the stadium, this is a great opportunity to have a uh, you know an auxiliary layer 
another layer or another level on top of what's going on on the, on the field, right? You know, baseball is very exciting to me, but it's not to some people. But if you add the gamification, like what we're talking about here, all of a sudden, um, it, it adds a new layer. And, and uh, just in this conversation, we've been talking for 50 minutes. I think that like, I've probably had a thousand ideas that could, you know, you know they're rabbit holes for you, but they're, in, they're so intriguing to me about what can happen. So what I think that I need to do with you, David, is to have you back on the show uh, in, in a quarter or two to try to, to see yeah. how things are going, to see, you know, you've closed your round at that point, you're moving forward, you, you know, you're seeing some expansion globally. And then, okay, so what are the things you're seeing out there when it comes to adoption of these things? And, and how, how has it been to drive revenue to, to physical locations? I hope you're up for that. Definitely, definitely. Man. All right, so now that you've got me all excited, I have to end this. Um, <laughs> how, do you, how do people find out about you guys? So you can come to our website. It's uh, thetaplab.com. And uh, you can uh, reach, to, uh, reach out to us directly through there as well. So. And you can download, obviously, this from the iTunes uh, from the App Store. Yep, Tap City, one word. It's live on the App Store. Uh, you can play it on your iPhone, your iPod Touch, even your iPad. Accessible globally on every store, or is it? Uh, yes. Yeah, obviously. Here, there, and everywhere. And uh, who owns the lease of your office right now in Cambridge? In Cambridge? Is this, uh, <laughs> who, who's, uh, who, who's currently uh, in charge of that building right now? Uh, Tech Stars. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's right. Well, I'm just gonna say, like, has anybody gone in and tried to battle for ownership here? Or is it? Uh... I think one of the managing directors of TechStars actually owns the building right now. Uh, but um, who knows? You know, in the next 24 hours, uh, it could change hands. Do you? Yeah, like, I wonder if you don't want to insult him, right? It's like, uh, <laughs> hey, listen. Yeah, you know, there's a position player here that listen. I uh, I have a lot of respect for you. You can keep that building. It's like the Don, right? Don yeah. Corleone, right, or whatever. Anyway, look, David, I really appreciate you doing this. So, so go to the taplab.com. Go and take a look for Tap City in uh, in all of the app stores, mm-hmm. iOS only. Any any uh, plans to ship an Android or a BlackBerry version? We're hiring accordingly. So, okay. Uh, yeah. So the the philosophy there was get it right on the iPhone and then bring yeah. it over to the rest. That's it. Okay, I and mean, that's a pretty standard uh, assumption, and uh, and I like that approach. David, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate you coming on. Been very open and honest about what you guys are doing. I uh, love the insight. Uh, I love the concept. I can't wait to uh, to uh, start taking ownership of cities in uh, or ownership of my city here in uh, in Ottawa. And I challenge anybody who's listening to uh, to start taking some of the properties away from me. Go, give it a try. I'll come after you full force. As I said, the TapLab.com, Tap City on on App Store. Uh, David, thank you again. Appreciate your time. Rob, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, Good luck with this, and we'll have you back on in a little while. Great. For you guys who are still watching, listening, wherever you may be, whatever you may be doing, hopefully it's driving straight on the road or you're listening to this in the comforts of your own home, I really appreciate the fact that you've done this, that you spent this time. I'm pretty sure you found a ton of insight into this. Go download the game. Go play around with it. If you're business, see if you can leverage it for your own good. Go and make some money out of this and help David uh, make some money as well. I thank you for listening and watching. David, I thank you for being a part of it. We'll see you next time on Untether.tv. See you later, everybody. Bye, guys.